All right, folks, get ready for a deep dive. Today, Earth and space sciences. Sounds exciting. It is. We've got this stack of notes. Looks like someone's prepping for the CSET. Ah, yes, the CSET, a rite of passage for aspiring teachers. You said it. And this teacherpreps.com study guide is pretty intense. The solar system, rocks, the water cycle even? Well, it does cover a pretty broad range of topics. Yeah. But that's what makes Earth and space science so fascinating, right? Yeah, absolutely. So let's break it down, get to the must-know stuff, but, you know, keep it fun. Sounds like a plan. And, you know, it's amazing how we encounter scientific principles every day without even realizing it. Totally. Like what? Well, take the sun. It rises in the east, sets in the west. We see it all the time. But do we really think about why? Good point. I mean, it's so familiar. It kind of just blends into the background. Exactly. But there's some pretty cool science behind it. It's all about Earth's rotation. OK, Earth's rotation, meaning? Our planet is constantly spinning on its axis. And that spin is what makes day and night. So it's not that the sun's moving. It's us spinning towards and away from it. Whoa. Precisely. And it takes about 24 hours for Earth to complete one full rotation, which is what we call a day. Makes sense. But wait, we're spinning, but also going around the sun, right? Right. Earth's orbit, that year-long journey around the sun. My head's spinning just thinking about it, all that motion. <laughs> uh-huh. It's a cosmic dance. And it's this combo of rotation and revolution that creates our experience of time and, get this, the changing seasons. The seasons? Okay, hold on. we got to talk about the moon, too. Always changing shape up there. What's that about? <sighs> yes, the lunar faces. It's all about how much of the moon's sunlit surface we can see from down here. Okay, go on. I'm listening. Imagine the moon's like a ball a flashlight shining on one side. As it orbits Earth, we see different amounts of that lit up part. Okay, so like when it's between us and the sun, it's dark new moon. Exactly. Then as it moves along, we see a crescent, then a quarter moon, half lit up. Then it gets bigger, gibbous moon, right? Until bam, full moon, whole thing's glowing. You got it. And then the cycle reverses as it keeps orbiting. This is making so much sense. Now, I've always wondered, the moon affects our tides too, doesn't it? Absolutely. The moon's gravity creates these bulges of water on Earth on the sides closest and farthest from it. And those bulges are high tides. You got it. High tides. The areas in between, those are low tides. So it's not just that the moon's there, but it's gravity's actually tugging at our oceans. Yeah. Crazy. It is pretty amazing. And think about this. When the sun, earth, and moon line up just right, their combined gravity makes even stronger tides. Spring tides, we call them. So like a cosmic power up for the tides. Yeah. Okay, from our little corner of space, let's zoom out. The whole solar system. Planets, comets, asteroids, the works. But first, we got to address the elephant in the room. Or should I say dwarf planet? Pluto. What's the deal? Is it in or out? Ah, uh, the Pluto debate. Classic. It really sparked a lot of discussion about what we even mean by planet. Yeah, I remember that whole thing. So what makes a planet a planet, and why did Pluto get demoted? Well, back in 2006, the International Astronomical Union, they came up with three criteria. First, got to orbit the sun. That's a given. Makes sense. What else? It has to be massive enough that its own gravity pulls it into a round shape, mostly round. Okay, roundness achieved. What's the third test? Third, it has to have cleared the neighborhood so to speak. No other similar-sized objects sharing its orbit. Ah, so that's where Pluto tripped up. Too much company out there in the Kuiper belt. Exactly. Pluto's sharing its space with other icy bodies, so demotion to dwarf planet. But some scientists still argue other factors should matter, like geological activity. Science is always evolving, right? Classifications can change as we learn more. Okay, enough about Pluto. What about comets and asteroids? They seem pretty different from planets. They are. Comets Think of them as cosmic snowballs. Mm. Ice, dust, rock, all mixed together. And they have those amazing tails. I've always loved seeing pictures of those. Right. And those tails form when the comet gets close to the sun. The heat vaporizes the ice, creates this glowing coma, and often a tail, sometimes stretching millions of kilometers. Wow, so dramatic. So comets are icy. What about asteroids? Asteroids, those are mostly rock, much smaller than planets, and most of them hang out in the asteroid belt. The asteroid belt? Where is that? Between Mars and Jupiter. It's like this cosmic highway of rocks orbiting the sun. Okay, so we've got icy comets and rocky asteroids zipping around. Now, back to Earth for a sec. Why do we have seasons? Is it because we're closer to the sun in summer? That's a common misconception, actually. The Earth's orbit is slightly elliptical, but the distance variation isn't enough to cause the seasons. So what's the real reason? It's all about the tilt. The Earth's tilt on its axis. The tilt? Okay, I'm intrigued. Tell me more. 
So Earth is tilted at about 23.5 degrees. As it goes around the sun, that tilt means different parts of the planet get varying amounts of direct sunlight throughout the year. So when the northern hemisphere is tilted towards the sun, we've got summer, and when it's tilted away, it's winter. Precisely. And the solstices, the summer and winter ones, those mark when the tilt is most extreme. Longest and shortest days of the year, right there. And what about the equinoxes, spring and fall? Those are special too, right? During the equinoxes, neither hemisphere is tilted towards or away from the sun. Day and night are pretty much equal all over the globe. So it's like a perfect balance point. Okay, so the tilt is the key to the seasons, not our distance from the sun. Mind blown. And this spinning and tilting, it affects how we measure time too, right? Absolutely. Earth's rotation gives us the 24-hour day, and time zones are based on longitude. Each time zone is a 15-degree slice of the Earth. So when it's noon in New York, it's 9 a.m. in Los Angeles because the Earth has rotated 45 degrees, bringing New York into the sunlight while Los Angeles is still catching up. Exactly. It's amazing how these basic movements of our planet shape our everyday lives. Totally. We've covered a lot from Earth's cosmic dance moves to the solar system's cast of characters. But now, let's get down to Earth, literally. Let's talk rocks. Let's do it. The Earth's crust is a fascinating place, always changing. And rocks, they tell the story of our planet's history. I love that. So we've got three main types of rocks, right? Sedimentary, igneous, and metamorphic. What's the difference? All right, sedimentary rocks, think of them as nature's recycling project. They're formed from tiny bits of other rocks, minerals, sometimes even the remains of ancient organisms. Like layers of sand on the beach hardening over time. Exactly. Imagine those layers getting compacted, cemented together. That forms sandstone. So it's like building a rock wall layer by layer. Cool. What about igneous rocks? Those sound intense. Igneous rocks, they're born from fire, literally. They form when molten rock magma cools and solidifies. So volcanoes. Volcanoes are one way, yes. When lava erupts and cools on the surface, that forms extrusive igneous rocks, like basalt. But magma can also cool slowly underground, forming intrusive igneous rocks, like granite. So igneous rocks have a fiery past, either deep underground or erupting from volcanoes. What about metamorphic rocks? Metamorphic rocks are the transformers of the rock world. They start out as either sedimentary or igneous, but then intense heat and pressure deep inside the Earth's crust, they change, their structure and composition get altered. So it's like they get a geological makeover. Give me an example. Marble. You know marble, right? It forms from limestone, which is sedimentary, but under heat and pressure, it recrystallizes, becomes that beautiful, strong marble we use for buildings and sculptures. So the Earth is basically a giant rock recycling plant, constantly transforming rocks from one type to another. That's a great way to put it. It's a continuous cycle of creation, destruction, and transformation. Rocks are amazing. Right. And speaking of rocks, we got to talk about minerals too, right? Of course. Minerals are like the ingredients in a rock recipe. They're naturally occurring inorganic solids, each with a specific chemical formula and crystal structure. Like quartz, with those beautiful crystal shapes, or calcite, which fizzes when you put acid on it. Exactly. And some minerals, or minerals, those are especially valuable, they get mined because they contain useful elements. Like iron ore for making steel or copper for wiring. You got it. So those little crystals and rocks end up powering our homes and building our cities. Pretty amazing, right? It is. Okay, so we've got these rocks made of minerals, but how do we get those massive landforms? Mountains, valleys, all that. That's where plate tectonics comes in, this incredible theory that explains how the Earth's surface is constantly changing, moving, shaping. Plate tectonics. I've heard the term, but to be honest, it always sounded kind of complicated. Well, it's a big idea, but we can break it down. Imagine the Earth's crust as a giant jigsaw puzzle, but the pieces are always shifting and bumping into each other. A moving jigsaw puzzle. Okay, I'm listening. These pieces, they're called tectonic plates, and they're driven by convection currents in the mantle, the layer beneath the crust. It's like a giant conveyor belt moving these massive plates around. So what happens when those plates collide? That's when things get exciting. At convergent plate boundaries, that's where plates crash head on. The pressure can buckle and fold the crust, creating mountains. No way. So like the Himalayas, those were formed by plates colliding. Exactly. The Himalayas, the tallest mountains in the world, are the result of two continental plates colliding. It's a slow motion collision, but an incredibly powerful one. Wow. So mountains are born from these epic clashes between tectonic plates. What else can happen at these boundaries? Well, sometimes one plate gets forced under the other. It's called subduction. 
This can create deep ocean trenches, and those are some of the deepest places on Earth. It can also trigger volcanic eruptions. Volcanoes! Talk about powerful forces of nature. So how do volcanoes erupt at these plate boundaries? When one plate sinks under the other, it melts due to the heat and pressure. That molten rock, magma, is lighter than the surrounding rock, so it rises. If it finds a pathway, boom, volcanic eruption. So volcanoes are like Earth's pressure valves, releasing molten rock from deep inside. Incredible. Are there other types of plate boundaries? You bet. Yeah. There are divergent boundaries where plates move apart. Magma rises up there too, creating new crust. That's happening right now in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean, the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. Wait, so the Atlantic Ocean is getting wider? Slowly, but yes. And then there are transform boundaries where plates slide past each other. Like the San Andreas Fault in California. I've heard that's a transform boundary. You're right. Transform boundaries are notorious for causing earthquakes. The plates get stuck, pressure builds, then suddenly releases, causing the ground to shake. Plate tectonics, it's like this constant slow motion ballet of the Earth's crust, creating mountains, volcanoes, earthquakes. It's mind blowing. But now I'm thinking about those smaller scale features like smooth rocks in a river or those giant sand dunes and deserts. How do those form? Those are shaped by weathering, erosion, and deposition, nature's sculpting tools. They're constantly at work shaping and reshaping the Earth's surface. Okay, let's talk about those tools. I'm ready to learn how nature sculpts the landscape.